Okay, um, we are on part two of chapter three, um, halfway down at page 42, if you're following at home. And sent them off early the next morning for the walk to school. Not far short of three miles, Mr Reynolds had said. You'll do it inside three parts of an hour, no question. It seemed more like ten minutes. Every bend brought another one and every hill a steeper one ahead. Jip came along with them as far as the crossroads at the end of the lane and then he stood looking after them, his tail drooping mournfully. They ran the last half mile down into the village, their gas masks banging up and down on their backs. They had seen the village from the Reynolds's cottage. It stood on a hillside, a cluster of cottages with thatched roofs grouped under a tall grey church tower. The village came upon them suddenly. They ran round a bend by a signpost and there was the school, just as Anne had explained. It was a long, low, gabled building built of purple grey stone and grey tiles mottled with lichen. The playground outside was full. They were not late. Once inside the gate, they looked around for their friends from Islington and tried to ignore the inquisitive looks and huddled whispers of the village children. Where are they? said Tucky. Perhaps they're late. But the bell went as David was speaking. The school was a big one, a big room on one floor with a great black boiler at the end and two long rows of desks. The row at the back on a raised floor so that the children could see all of the blackboard in front. There were only 20 or 30 children there, boys and girls. Coats were hung up by the door and gas masks over the backs of the desks and everyone sat down. Everyone, that is, except David and Tucky, who stood bemused by the door, clutching their lunch boxes and gas masks. At the far end of the room, beyond the boiler, a door opened and there was a sudden and immediate silence as an old man walked slowly and deliberately towards the teacher's desk by the blackboard. As he sat down, all the children stood up and chanted in unison, Good morning, Mr Cooper. Sit down said the teacher quietly. Good morning, children. The roll call, please, Angela. They got girls, Tucky whispered. Do you think this is the right school? Did you say something, lad? The old man had swivelled round in his chair and was looking at them over the rims of his glasses. We, we were wondering, sir, David said. We were told to come to school here, but none of our friends are here, so we thought perhaps we were in the wrong school. You're David Carey and Tony Tucker, they nodded. Then you're in the right place. In this school, we always call the roll before we do anything else. Do you understand? He spoke clearly and kindly. Angela called the roll and each child stood up in turn. And then last of all, she called Tony Tucker, David Carey. Mr Cooper then stood up and shook both of them by the hand. Welcome to our little school. I am the one and only teacher and my name is Mr Cooper, though no doubt the children call me something else. I require you to be polite, honest and hard-working. That is all. I hope you'll be very happy whilst you're with us. What about all the others? Tucky said. Your friends from London have all gone to the Imberley School. It's bigger there, there's more room. Mr Cooper turned to speak to the class. David and Tucky are evacuees, children. I told you we might be seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, I told you we might be seeing new faces soon, didn't I? Well, here they are. I want you to remember that they are away from home and that we are all very strange to them. We must all look after them and make them feel at home. Their welcome from the village children was cautious enough at first, but in morning playtime, they were crowded into a corner under a big elm tree and bombarded with questions about London, about their homes, about German bombers. For a few days, they felt they were the centre of attention. Whenever either of them spoke up in class, everyone listened, and they were invited to eat their packed lunches at every house in the village. But it soon wore, wore off, and within a few weeks, they had been accepted as two townies who were part of the village school. There was a pattern to their lives broken only by letters from mothers and the occasional glimpse of Miss Roberts in her hat whenever she came to the village. David's mother was stationed as an ack-ack battery on the south coast and wrote once a month. 
Tucky's parents were still in London, but hardly ever wrote. There was the walk to school after breakfast, usually in the rain, then morning prayers and the first lesson always with the gas masks on, when they all sat sweating and trying to concentrate on Mr Cooper's voice. Unless the sun was shining, they took their packed lunches to a friend's house where they were always welcomed with warm cocoa. After afternoon lessons, there was the long walk home to the farm. Jip would meet them at the end of the lane by the crossroads and they would race him home to tea with Anne in the smoky warmth of the kitchen. All that spring, there were long walks on the moor that came down to where the farm ended. Mr Reynolds kept some sheep up there and the two boys came to know it quite well. The war, London and Islington seemed to be in another world. Of course, David looked forward to his mother's letter and kept everyone under his pillow and read and reread them whenever he could, but they seemed unreal. There were signs a war was on. Mr Reynolds went off home guard duty twice a week. There was a searchlight and an observation post in the village and of course they still had their gas mask to drill, but there were no more bombs and there was no more fear. They came to recognise Churchill's gruff voice over Mr Reynolds's crackling wireless set and they noticed that Anne lost all the laughter in her eyes whenever the war was mentioned. But it hardly ever was. Mr Reynolds used to say he was too busy to worry about the war. Then, one night in June, the skyline of the moor was lit up with gun flashes and a distant crump of bombing miles away on the other side of the moor brought the war back to David and Tucky and shattered their newfound peace. <laughs>